Well, good morning, or good afternoon, and welcome. I <laughs> see where I've been sleeping all day. No, good afternoon to you all. Welcome. We're delighted to have you here, and it's a, it's a real privilege to, uh, to welcome Ambassador Thomas Greenfield. Um, and I will say just a word of introduction, but Charlie uh, Idell is going to do that, really. I just want to say I'm glad to see all of you here. And uh, when I was talking with Charlie, I thought, you know, uh, uh, having a program on a Monday afternoon that's about the Pacific Islands, will we get anybody to come? And, I said, and he said, yeah. I said, people are interested, and I'm really most impressed that you, Ambassador, are, are so interested. Let me just say a word of welcome to Joanne Burdian, who's the uh, Rear Admiral for the Assistant Commandant for Response Policy for the uh, Coast Guard, uh, Carmen Cantor, who's Assistant Secretary for Insular Affairs, um, Mario D, I may hope I didn't pronounce that improperly, Ambassador from Nauru, um, Cephas Keo, who is Charge Aid Affairs from Papua New Guinea. Uh, Colette Morgan, who is assistant, uh, Deputy Assistant USTR for Southeast Asia. And uh, Brandon Ramsey, who is a Staff Director for the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, I just have to share a little story. I was just back talking with Ambassador Thomas Greenfield, and she said something that I think is both uh, true and an insight into her character. She said, you know, I, when I sit in the, on the floor of the General Assembly, you know, I'm sitting there representing the United States, but every other representative there is my equal. And that's a testament to how she views her mission, you know, that she views them as equals, not, there's no superiority thing going on here in her mind. And that's a very refreshing thing. I can't say that that's typical, you know, of American foreign policy elites, but it's welcome. And, you know, it's just a testament to your character. Now, I think that comes from 35 really distinguished years in the Foreign Service, becoming ambassador to Liberia. Uh, but now you're posted. I don't know how in the world the president talked you into coming out of public life <laughs> to go back, but you're now the permanent representative at the UN. And, you know, people don't know this, but that's the only ambassador that gets invited into the NSC. You know, outside of the Secretary of State, only the ambassador to the UN gets invited into the NSC. And again, it's a testament to her, uh, her intellect, her character, and the fact that you were willing to come out of private life again after 35 years and uh, serve this country. So I want to say thank you. Let me turn to Dr. Charles Adele, who is going to do the formal introduction, but I didn't want to miss the opportunity to greet you and thank you for coming. Charlie. Great. Thanks very much, Dr. Hamry, and thank you especially, uh, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield, for joining us here today. It's quite an honor to have you here with us at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I'm Charles Edel, the Australia Chair uh, here at CSIS. Uh, given the Ambassador's wide range of experience in foreign policy and national security, it hardly comes as a surprise that the President asked her to go to the Cook Islands for the Pacific Islands Forum this past fall to represent the United States there and have presence for the United States in the Pacific. Now, uh, look, I should say that on the one hand, there is absolutely nothing new about that. For most of American history, the United States has been deeply engaged in the Pacific. Uh, I won't give you too much of a history lesson, but starting in the 1780s, American commercial ships were plowing through and across the Pacific. By the time you got to the 19th century, we had expanded that commercial presence to include both diplomatic and naval engagement across the Pacific. And it hardly needs saying that America's presence, engagement with the Pacific, was felt deeply throughout the 20th century. But, and there is a but here, over the last several decades, American focus on and attention to the Pacific has atrophied you can see signs that this is clearly changing. The Biden administration released its first ever Pacific Partners strategy. The White House has hosted leaders from all the Pacific Islands at the White House, not once, but twice in 2022 and 2023. We are in the process of opening new U.S. embassies across the Pacific. We have pushed out the first ever U.S. ambassador to the Pacific Island Forum. 
we are seeing an increase in both Coast Guard and Peace Corps presence in the Pacific where they had not been for the previous several decades. And perhaps most significant, Congress has now funded our compacts of free association with Palau, uh, with Marshall Islands, and with the Federated States of Micronesia. However, and this is, I think, the most important point, this is just the start. And to discuss the importance of U.S. efforts to walk us through what we should expect to come next, I'm thrilled to welcome Ambassador Thomas Greenfield here to CSIS. Uh, the ambassador is going to come up here and offer some initial comments, after which my colleague Catherine Pack, uh, senior fellow with the Australia Chair and formerly director of the Pacific and Southeast Asia at the NSC, is going to come up here to run her through a conversation, after which point we'll open the conversation up. Uh, ambassador, we know how extraordinarily busy your schedule is and just really want to thank you, not only for taking the time to come to CSIS, but to making the time to talk about an extremely vital, important part of the world. Ambassador. Good afternoon, everyone. It's really great to be here with you. Uh, let me start by thanking John and Charlie for the warm welcome and uh, thank you to everyone at CSIS, uh, the whole team, for having me here today. Last November, I had the privilege of leading a high-level interagency delegation to the Pacific Islands Forum Leaders Meeting in the Cook Islands. I will admit here that I had to look at where the Cook Islands was on the map. I have a huge map in my office. It actually was off the map uh, because it is so far. But I learned that uh, Rarotonga, the largest and most populous of the islands, no building can be taller than a coconut tree. And that's a true fact. I gained a new appreciation of the vastness and the isolation of the Pacific and the important message it sends when we take the time and make the effort to actually show up. Most of all, I learned the stories of so many extraordinary Pacific Islanders, leaders and community members who, like all of us, want to build better lives for their children and benefit from sustainable development in the region, who are worried about climate change and how it might wreak havoc on their lives and livelihoods and their children's futures, and who have already felt the effects of this existential global challenge. I'm proud I was able to tell them face to face that the United States is standing with them, we're standing for them, and that we have their backs. My visit was the first of its kind since the U.S. established diplomatic relationships with the Cook Islands and Niue and recognized both as sovereign independent states. During my time there, I was able to reaffirm the United States plan for empowering communities like the ones I met with and the 2.3 million Pacific Islanders in the region. After all, the United States is a Pacific nation as well. We share a unique, long-standing history with the Pacific Islands. We have robust people-to-people -people ties that span generations and our economic prosperity and national security are inextricably linked. At the same time, though, the Biden administration recognizes that we cannot take these vital relationships for granted. And so since day one, we've worked to strengthen the ties that bind us. That includes the passage of the Compacts of Free Association Amendments Act, COFA. This agreement will fully fund $7.1 billion in new assistance over the next two decades, helping the COFA nations to provide essential government services like health care, education, infrastructure, and capacity building. We will continue to make good on our commitment to strengthen our relationships in the Pacific and invest in the people. Of course, COFA is just one aspect of a broader approach. We also developed the first ever U.S. strategy, as you heard, for the Pacific Islands and continue to strengthen our support for the region's priorities outlined in the Pacific Islands Forum 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific Continent. 
We're expanding our diplomatic and development presence in the region with new embassies, uh, expanded USAID footprint, and the return of Peace Corps volunteers to a number of islands in the region. In fact, when I took my trip, the head of Peace Corps and a USAID representative were part of my delegation. We're deepening high-level engagements, including with President Biden himself. We're bolstering the Pacific regional architecture and deepening our cooperation with the Pacific Island Forum because we know this region is strongest when it is united. And we're working closely with like-minded partners to enhance digital connectivity in the region. Since the first summit with the PIF leaders, the U.S. has announced more than eight billion U.S. dollars in new funding for the Pacific Islands and robust new programs to address climate change, maritime security, gender equity, and more. Together, these actions reflect the incredible progress we've made together, deepening our diplomatic relationships, develop, development partnerships, and security cooperation with the Pacific. And they paint a picture for the future of the U.S. Pacific relationship. Over the next year, our goal is to continue implementing and delivering on the commitments we've made in the past three years, to demonstrate through our words and our actions our enduring partnership with the region and its people and our commitment to elevating the voices of the Pacific as we address shared challenges. Meeting this moment takes a robust network of partners, and I'm proud of the network we've created to that end. Later this month, I'll head to East Asia to meet with some of those stakeholders in person, where we will discuss, among other things, our shared priorities around nuclear nonproliferation, closing digital divides, and our work in the Security Council, including to support the region. We also look forward to supporting Pacific Island countries through our preparations and participation at the fourth international conference on small island developing states coming up at the end of May. This will be a once in a decade opportunity to bring together diverse stakeholders to build partnerships and make new commitments. In the meantime, I'm excited to have the opportunity to sit down with all of you, with Catherine today, and talk about where we've been, where we're going, and how we get there together. I thank you all for your attention, and I look forward to our conversation. Thank you, Ambassador, for thank your you. words. As a reminder for our audience, both here and online, you can continue to submit questions via the uh, Submit Questions Now button on our event webpage. You can find that at CSIS.org under the Australia chair on the event page. So Ambassador, thank you so much for talking us through some of the major muscle movements that have been made over the last uh, couple of years under this administration. And as Dr. Edel said, there's been a really significant ramp up in U.S. engagement in the Pacific. Part of this ramp up has been a plethora of promises from this administration, new embassies, as you said, banking, investment, climate change. Having been out to the Pacific and heard from the Pacific leaders and talked to them, where do you think the U.S. should really be prioritizing as we look ahead? Uh, that's an excellent question, and it's a question that I was asked by the Pacific Islanders when I was there. Because what they said to me is, we're used to you guys showing up once. Uh, we're used to you paying a moment of attention to us. But what we need to know is, is this, some, is this a commitment? Are we going to see you again? Is it more than just showing up? Are you going to honor all of the commitments that you've made? And I was able to assure them that we were that our intention was for a long-term relationship. The COFA funding, I think, is the first indication of that because it's funding for two decades. Mm. And that was just uh, passed uh, through, through Congress. And it, for our members of Congress and staff who are in the audience, I want to thank you for that because that was an extraordinary commitment that actually showed the Pacific Island nations that we're in it for the long term. Absolutely. 
One of the key tenets of the Pacific Partnership Strategy that you mentioned uh, previously is to amplify Pacific voices on the international stage, something you are uniquely positioned to, to see. And as you know, the Pacific Island nations are very vocal at the yes. United Nations, yes. uh, promoting uh, issues that are very critical to them, such as uh, maintaining maritime boundaries with sea level rise or loss and damage due to climate change. Could you give us a little um, of your thoughts on where those subjects lie in the U.S. system and how we can best work through the U.N. to help amplify those voices on the international stage? You know, stage? it's a high priority for us, mm -hmm. and it's a high priority at the highest levels of the U.S. government. The fact that the president has been engaging on uh, Pacific Island issues uh, during his administration, I think, is a, a clear uh, representation of how committed we are to amplifying uh, their, their voices. In New York, I have a very unique perch because I can meet with all of these countries all at once. I've had several meetings with the groupings of Pacific, Pacific Island uh, countries. I have met with other groupings where we have committed as a group to meet with Pacific Island countries. We have the Quad that includes uh, Japan and Australia and, uh, and India. And we met recently and agreed that it was important that as a group we also engage because they're equally uh, engaged on, on these issues. Uh, and I think this is uh, a commitment that uh, will be reflected in all of the work that we do in the future. We've recognized their concerns about their sovereignty uh, as uh, sea, sea levels rise, that they still are you know, they will still exist as a nation regardless of what happens to, to their islands because of climate change. We've made a commitment to the 1.5 Celsius uh, increase and they uh, have heard us and they're holding us to that commitment and we're continuing to maintain our, our commitments to all of them. Uh, so we have a long way to go, but we've gone a long ways already, and I think that that commitment is showing in, in the efforts that we're making right now. Thank you. Um, one of the concerns that United States and like-minded partners often express is that Chinese efforts in the Pacific are going against uh, many of Pacific Island um, equities that they may have, and of course, uh, U.S. interest in the Pacific is not just because of global competition, but that's a factor that the Pacific Islands are very aware of. Uh, I'm curious your thoughts from the U.N. perspective, what you see on the ground there in terms of Chinese and other efforts to countermand the, the international rules-based order that benefit the Pacific, and how you work with Pacific Island and other countries to combat that. It's, it's a huge problem that, uh, that we've encountered specifically in New York. But I think it's a, it's a global problem as well, where the Chinese have made a very concerted, forceful effort to kind of rewrite the rules of the road uh, to reflect its own vision of what they see uh, as the future, including uh, putting in, uh, ins inserting in, in UN documents uh, issues that uh, go against the, the core values that we have and the core values that many of these countries have. But what we've been clear on, and I made uh, uh, that uh, statement as well when I was in uh, the Cook Islands, is that we're not trying to force countries to choose between us and China. What we're doing is giving them a choice uh, to make. Many countries will say we're, we're forced into these relationships because we don't have other choices we're giving them those other choices. And those other choices mean having the U.S. Uh, have their backs, having the U.S. Uh, standing with them side by side as they address some of the challenges that China is uh, forcing upon them. Thank you. Um, I'd like to go to some of our audience questions that have come in. And again, people can continue to submit those during the conversation. Um, Jessica Stone from VOA uh, news asks, some Pacific Island leaders would say there's a trust deficit when it comes to the United States in terms of attention to the region. How are you using your role at the UN to improve relationships between the Washington and the Pacific Islands and to prepare U.S. diplomats who are now heading out to the region to understand the priorities of the region? 
you know, that, that's, again, a question that I was asked by uh, leaders when, uh, when I uh, uh, met with them. And um, our commitment is really an ironclad commitment. And we know that there have been times when we were there for a day, uh, there for a meeting, and, not, uh, and didn't show up again. So I regularly meet with my Pacific Island counterparts uh, in, in New York. I go to them. I don't always ask them to, to come to me. Uh, I mentioned when we were speaking before that uh, with one country I went, uh, made an appointment and went to that country's uh, mission and they told me they had never had a visit by a U.S. permanent representative in the history of their time in the, uh, uh, in the United Nations. And I don't just call on them when I need them. Uh, I call on them uh, regularly and show them the respect that they deserve as a sovereign uh, country. And I think that has gone a, an extraordinarily uh, long way in, in showing our commitment in developing the relationships, in the engagements that we have. Uh, you know, when you're the USPR, uh, your, your schedule is uh, just out of control. You, <laughs> you don't have a, um, you don't always have control over your schedule. The one thing I've controlled in my schedule is to say that every country is equal and that I will have uh, uh, courtesy calls with every single country. There are 193. I will tell you in three years, I've only gotten through about 157. Uh, and many have changed. So I, there are some countries I'm seeing over and over again in these one-on-one -on -one courtesy calls. Uh, but my goal is to hit every one of them. And I think at this point, I may have gotten all of the Pacific Island countries either one-on-one -on -one or in, in groupings. That's fantastic. I'm curious your thoughts on, um, you know, another tenant of the Indo-Pacific strategy of this administration is the partnership with partners and allies as we do everything globally. And obviously we have wonderful partners in the Pacific, but we also have strong partners and allies that are trying to also work with the Pacific, uh, Japan, uh, Australia, New Zealand, both of whom are members of the Pacific Island Forum themselves. What are your thoughts on how we are working with our partners and allies currently in the Pacific, how we might do better, how we might collaborate in a better yeah, this way? This is something, uh, again, that came up during, during my visit, and I did meet with partners uh, when I was there. I met with the New Zealand now speaker. Uh, I met uh, with an uh, Australian counterpart. I met with uh, um, uh, Indonesia. Uh, so there were a number of countries, larger countries from the region that mm. uh, we had the opportunity to, to talk about how we can work together. We're working, for example, with Australia. Uh, I think it's $65 billion. Ter Teresa, correct me if I'm wrong. Million? <laughs> Billion sounds better. <laughs> uh, $65 million uh, to uh, address uh, 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 digital uh, issues. Uh, we're working with uh, countries on youth programs and education uh, programs because we know we can't do it alone. And the countries in the region know the region even better than we know the region. Uh, I'm not going to say I know uh, the Cook Islands better than uh, New Zealand when I was told by the New Zealand uh, minister when he was there that there are more Cook Islanders living in New Zealand than they are li living on the island and every Cook Islander is a New, New Zealand uh, citizen is, uh, as well. So they clearly know uh, these countries uh, well and I think we have to take advantage of uh, the um, uh, you know, what they bring to the table, the tools that they bring to the table so that we can work together on, on our common uh, interests. And then I just add one thing that I, uh, I came away from uh, my visit with, and that is people want to be heard. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't want to just be talked to and spoken to. They want us to hear what their priorities are. 
uh, what they're dealing with in, in, with issues of climate change, how they're dealing with youth programs. And we have, uh, we announced a program to support the Pacific Island youth leader, leadership as well. How they're dealing with gender uh, issues, how they're dealing with the private sector and how we can engage with the private sector to help them to address some, some of their needs. So they wanted to be heard. And I did a lot of listening while I was there. I, I, I did less talking and more listening. Sounds like the right approach yeah. many times for US diplomats. Um, I'd like to go to uh, Judith Sefkin, former US ambassador to Fiji, Kiribati, Nauru, Tonga, and Tuvalu, uh, who asks, the success of US partnership with the Pacific Island countries will depend largely on the US ability to help address the region's top security threat, climate change through climate finance and other forms of assistance. Yet follow through will depend on Congress appropriating the necessary funds. Do you see a path forward? And, and I'll add a little bit onto this more broadly in your role as ambassador to the UN. Is there a role for the UN maybe in making climate finance more accessible on a global level? Well, first on the question related to our engagements with, uh, with Congress, the fact that uh, we got the, the, the COFA uh, through, I think, sends a very strong uh, message. And we continue to engage with Congress on other programs that we uh, want uh, to fund in the Pacific Islands. And I think they understand and appreciate the importance of us engaging with, uh, with Pacific Island uh, uh, nations. At the UN, that's an easy one. Uh, we have the SDGs. Uh, we have the Summit of, of, of the Future. We're dealing with a whole host of issues that are very specific to the priorities of uh, Pacific Island countries. And uh, working with those countries at the UN to address those issues, I think, are, are, are key to us. Looking at how we, we deal with, uh, with uh, oceans and uh, the importance of uh, addressing uh, uh, all, of, all of the SDGs, whether it's education, uh, gender equity, uh, uh, dealing with uh, infrastructure issues. All of these are issues that we address on a regular basis at the, at the UN. And I will uh, uh, mention that we were very, very uh, pleased uh, last week uh, that we got the, um, uh, 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 the resolution on AI uh, through uh, the UN, through a consensus vote. Uh, well, no vote. It was through consensus uh, that we got this resolution through. And the, and the, the important thing in that uh, resolution for many developing countries was breaking and, and bridging the, the digital divide. And that is something that Pacific Island countries will definitely <coughs> benefit from. Absolutely. As you mentioned, there's such a tyranny of distance out there yeah. between them. And that connectivity is so yeah. essential. Yeah. Um, whether we're talking health or security or, or just being able to connect with the, with the rest of the world. Um, you mentioned the, the U.S. being a Pacific country, which mm -hmm. we, we definitely are. I think I've heard numbers of two million U.S. citizens actually live in the Pacific, whether it's in territories or Hawaii. Um, Greg Brown from the Australian Strategic Policy in Institute, ASPE, asks uh, an interesting one here. Leaders in American Samoa and Guam have expressed desires to join the Pacific Island Forum, similar to participation of the New Zealand realm countries and the various French territories. What is the administration's position on these American desires, uh, PIF inclusivity uh, via all the Pacific Islanders more generally, and the possibility of the US as a Pacific country joining the PIF? Well, I think right now, of course, we are a, um, we're a partner with the, with the PIF. Mm -hmm. That means that all of the territories are partners with the PIF. They are engaging on a regular basis. I stopped in Hawaii on the, on the way to, uh, uh, to the forum and uh, heard from the governor that he was very actively uh, engaged. And I would encourage Samoa and other uh, uh, US territories to be actively uh, engaged and be part of what we are doing as as the United States uh, on uh, dealing with Pacific Island countries. I think that there is a commitment uh, for all of these territories, plus Hawaii and others to be uh, directly engaged with what is happening in the Pacific Islands because they also have the same challenges. 
uh, and they should know that we are uh, absolutely working to ensure that their concerns are being brought to the table as well. Absolutely. Do you think there's ways um, that we, uh, as a as a nation, could use our territories and the leaders in the Pacific better to engage with the Pacific, or should we always be doing this from D.C.? No, no, no. I think absolutely they should be part of it. That was why I stopped in Hawaii uh, to ensure that they were part of it. They have their own connections, mm -hmm. uh, their own relationships, their own voices. Uh, so I absolutely support them having their own voices. They're part of us. So it's not just us going out there representing them, but it's us joining with them to uh, ensure that their issues are on the table as well. And uh, yes, it probably makes more sense when you send a, a delegation to have a cabinet official do it. Uh, and I think the Pacific Island nations appreciate it that a member of President Biden's cabinet was there, but in no way my, does my presence diminish the important voices that uh, the Pacific Island territories of the U.S. and Hawaii would uh, have in addressing these issues. Absolutely. Um, Cleo Pascal asks a very similar question, wondering uh, if you're engaging at all with um, the Congress uh, men and women from our territories, such as from American Samoa and Guam, on some of these issues. Um, who may have broader expertise on the Pacific region. Uh, I, I have had engagements with them, and in fact, a group of them came to New York before I uh, went off on, on the visit and I met with them. I, when I returned, I uh, met with uh, some individual uh, Congress members to share what I learned on that visit, but also it's my, uh, it's my belief that we have to always engage with members of Congress. Uh, so on a regular basis, I'm on the Hill, I, I answer their, their calls, uh, I answer their letters, and I actually proactively uh, engage with, uh, with members from, from that region as well as in other regions of the world. Phenomenal. Based on what you're hearing from the Pacific leaders and what you heard last year um, at the, the Leaders' Summit, obviously we've been ramping up engagement, lots going on, as you said. Where are we still falling short, the U.S., and, and where should we be doubling down our efforts? I think we have to double down our efforts in just having high level. It, my visit can't be a one-off. So we've had other members go, and we need to ensure that we have other cabinet members go on a regular basis. Uh, as I said, it's, it's distant and it's isolated. You have to make an effort to do it. Uh, and so encouraging other members of cabinet to make that effort to get out there uh, to ensure that they see us uh, on, a, on a regular basis. That's one area where we have to double down. The second one is, uh, again, you mentioned Congress, is engaging with Congress mm -hmm. to ensure that we get uh, the funding uh, that we need. We have a request then now for funding for the Pacific Islands mm -hmm. Young Leaders uh, program. I want to see that uh, funding uh, come to fruition. I work with the uh, Young African, uh, yes, called YALI, the Young African Leaders Initiative, and I saw the importance of, uh, of that initiative in terms of bringing the voices of young people forward. And I want to see that happen in the Pacific Islands as, as well, that we can actually uh, promote and mentor and encourage young young voices to address the issues of today as well as the uh, the issues of the future. Uh, third, on Peace Corps, I, as I mentioned, I traveled with the Peace Corps, the head of Peace Corps uh, out there, and there are a number of countries who have asked for Peace Corps uh, to return, and having that happen is going to require funding for Peace Corps. Uh, I am a great fan of Peace Corps. I was never a Peace Corps volunteer. It's the biggest regret of my life that I was not a Peace Corps volunteer. But I think it's one of the greatest programs we have because they are on the front lines of American diplomacy in terms of getting young people out into communities to meet uh, with uh, communities and really developing those long-term relationships because they, they live in, in communities. So getting the, the funding to get Peace Corps. And then fourth, our diplomatic presence. Uh, we've opened two new uh, uh, diplomatic uh, uh, 
uh, entities in uh, Cook Islands and, and uh, Nauru. Uh, we need to get our <laughs> diplomats out there and we need to look at where there are other places where we can have uh, uh, more diplomatic relations. We have to build those embassies uh, so that they see that we're, we're serious uh, about uh, that and get our presence. And then finally, I, I haven't spoken about uh, Ambassador Reed, uh, who is our um, a special envoy to the Pacific uh, Island Forum. Uh, she's amazing and we have to give her the resources so that her uh, her presence uh, can be felt and she's going to be on the front lines, really on the front lines of our diplomacy and I think that sends a very strong signal of how important the relationships are with, uh, with the Pacific Island countries. So again, giving her the resources that she needs to ensure that her presence uh, is, uh, is seen and, and respected. I, I've certainly heard the same on Peace Corps. In fact, it, it's not uncommon to talk to a Pacific Island leader who they themselves were taught by a, a Peace Corps volunteer or had a family member taught by a Peace Corps volunteer. The, the and what they said to me is Peace Corps volunteers never leave. Uh, so they go away, they uh, go on to new lives, but they never forget their Peace Corps families. Mm -hmm. And they always come back. They always uh, connect to their Peace Corps families. So again, uh, getting the Peace Corps program uh, ramped up and, and more robust will be, I think, a key part of, of uh, answering the call of the Pacific Island countries. And having that, those people-to-people -people ties on the yeah. ground. Although I'm not sure you should have any regrets. <laughs> <laughs> I do regret it. I, I always used to say for you young people in the, in the room, uh, Peace Corps was always my plan B, and I am uh, lucky enough in my life that all my plan A's worked out. I wish Peace Corps had been my plan A, uh, so I could have had that experience to add to uh, the many things that I've done. Rich. Um, uh, Aaron from the East West Center asks if you could go into a little more detail about the quad engagements that you mentioned. Uh, could you comment on what exactly the Quad intends to do in the Pacific and what commitments you'd like to see from India in, per in particular? Look, we are, we're an uh, informal group. We, we develop a lot of informal groups in, in New York where we come together to talk about common uh, uh, issues of, of, of interest and how we can bring our, our unified voices together on, on particular uh, issues. And this Quad group, as I mentioned, Australia, India and, um, and Japan. Uh, and so one of the things we discussed is how we can address as a, as a group some of the issues that uh, have, uh, or the priorities that have been raised by Pacific Island uh, countries. How can we bring our unified voices to supporting uh, their efforts? And first and foremost, what we plan to do is start out with meeting with them as a group which we've never done before, and hearing what their priorities are. So it's not about us going in, telling them what we're gonna do. Uh, it's about us going in as a group, hearing what they need us to do. Uh, and that is now uh, being, being planned for the, the coming weeks and months. Fantastic. Um, I have a question from Callie Cho, uh, Cook Islands Whale Research. Um, and this may get a little into the, the technical nature of the question, but uh, just appreciate whatever you can provide from your perspective at the UN. She's curious how the US is planning to advocate for sustainable manage, management of marine resources globally uh, and around the Pacific Island nations, such as with regard to deep sea mining, commercial fishing, and tourism. And these are all, of course, issues of uh, intense concern for the Pacific Islanders who depend so much on their maritime resources. Uh, again, that was a, a subject that was raised. I met with the Cook Island Prime Minister uh, who showed me these little nodules that are, uh, and I, again, more technical than I, I've been. I think it's, it's iron ore, but I'm, I'm not sure. And how important it is to be able to mine these, this resource without doing damage, uh, uh, ecological damage to, uh, uh, the, uh, to the sea. And they want, for example, uh, uh, companies, responsible uh, American companies or other companies who can come in who will take uh, into account their concerns about how this is managed. 
uh, and they talk to me about how they can engage with, uh, with those companies. In the UN, I think the important role uh, there is to uh, give them uh, the techn technical or te the technology resources uh, to address their concerns so that when they are negotiating, for example, uh, with companies or, or with other countries, they can negotiate from a, from a position of knowledge and strength, and they don't go into these negotiations without having the foreknowledge to negotiate the best deals uh, for their own countries. Uh, also raised with me was the issue of, of uh, 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 maritime fishing and the uh, use of their, their fishing lanes by, uh, by countries in particular, uh, concerns with uh, China uh, coming in and, and, and really st taking uh, fishing resources uh, without their permission, and how we could address, for example, helping them to build up their Coast Guard. So I also had a member of the Coast Guard from the region on my delegation as well, uh, who was able to engage with them on, on marine uh, protection and how to protect their, their coasts. These are also things that, again, the UN can bring to them. Uh, in, in their discussions. So this was a whole lot, and I, I will tell you, as I said, this was my first time engaging with uh, Pacific Island countries. I came away from those discussions with a uh, deep sense of a, a desire on their part for our active engagement and for us to stay engaged with them. And that's the message I brought back uh, to, uh, to the president. Uh, and to other members of the cabinet, that this is a long-term uh, relationship that we have, and we, it's not a one-off. So hopefully, is, uh, certainly from my standpoint, it's not a one-off, and hopefully over the course of the next couple of decades uh, with COFA, they will see that it's not a one-off. Well, many of our um, uh, measures that we're taking, such as COFA or opening new embassies, are much more in the realm of institutionalizing that engagement, yes. right? And I think that's been a, a real focus, as long as we can follow through yes. with, with some of them. Uh, similar to the last question, uh, another question from Eileen Natuzzi from Georgetown asks about health and, and health infrastructure. And um, you know, this is something I've heard many times as well in the Pacific, is that the lack of health infrastructure and the lack of health security is really a national security issue for these countries. And it, it cross cuts climate change, it cross cuts mm -hmm. food security and so many other issues. Is there anything at the UN level or, or are there any discussions at the UN um, on ways to help bolster the, the health infrastructure and the health security of these countries? You know, I think COVID, uh, the, the pandemic really uh, uh, highlighted and amplified the lack of capacity in so many countries to deal with health issues. And what we know is that this pandemic won't be our last, uh, but this pandemic really, I think, it, it, it encouraged and urged the, the world to come together to figure out how to support countries in like those countries in the Pacific Islands where there's not a very strong health care uh, system and part of our engagement, part of COFA, is to address the the health infrastructure issues uh, and to help these countries uh, uh, prepare for the next uh, pandemic. So WHO has been actively engaged uh, with these countries as well as other countries uh, around the world to ensure that they do have the wherewithal uh, to uh, withstand the the impact. Of a pandemic, so it's not just the health impact that they experienced. The economic impact was immense. The impact on their education system, immense. The 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 uh, uh, their economies are still trying to come out of this. So we all have a lot of work to do, and it can't again. It, it's not going to be done by the United States alone. It's going to take our partners in the region, and this is what the UN is for. Uh, so we have to work together in the UN as well to address these issues. Absolutely, and and for these many of these countries, COVID as a health issue actually was less of a problem than the, yeah, the, the than the economic the economic issue with tourism being such a a major part of um, of their economies. Um, another question from uh, Carlo Capuna at Sister Cities International, and I'm not sure you've you've um, you're 
that familiar with Sister Cities Ambassador, but this is a new initiative that was started to connect um, cities in the U.S. with uh, cities across the Pacific Islands. Um, but more generally, he asks, how have you seen these people, these types of people-to-people -people partnerships between countries impact global peace and security? You know, it's people-to-people -people relationships that really make a, a difference. We diplomats can do everything uh, in our toolkit. Uh, but ultimately, it is uh, about people, and the, the city pair relationships, I think, are truly important. I saw uh, the, uh, um, the city to city relationships in Africa and what that meant to uh, countries uh, in Africa and cities in the, in the United States. Mm -hmm. Uh, how it developed those people-to-people -people relationships, and I, I think it's important that we see those relationships develop uh, in the Pacific Islands. I was not aware of this particular uh, program, but I'm delighted to hear that uh, we do have uh, the city-to-city -city relationships. And it's just getting going, I'm yeah. really aware, because I, <laughs> I was in when we, we got it started. Um, I think we have time for one more. Uh, Alan Tidwell from Georgetown University also asks, what can the U.S. do via the U.N. Um, to advocate for change in development funding? And, and noting that, again, back to that, the idea of accessing finance, which is such a critical problem for so many of the Pacific Island countries, and they often voice that the bureaucracy of multilateral banks or other international um, financing is just complicated for uh, smaller countries to deal with. So what can the U.S. do to support greater access to development funds, both through UNDP or through the various multilateral development banks? Well, certainly in New York, uh, through UNDP, UNICEF, uh, other uh, agencies, we're on those boards. Uh, we're on the board of UNDP, we're on the board of UNICEF, uh, we are really on World Food Program. So we do uh, have a, a say in how those organizations address issues uh, that developing countries bring to, to the table. And our voice is clearly uh, a voice that is uh, very powerful uh, because we, in, in almost all cases, are the largest donors. Uh, to, uh, uh, to these organizations, certainly to the humanitarian ones, but I think even at UNDP. Uh, so we can speak for and promote uh, the interests of, of developing countries in a way that uh, I think is important and it's something that I know that we do on a regular basis. And that's certainly the case with the international financial institutes as well. Uh, we do uh, think there is um, uh, room for and time for the reform of, of the FAs. It's not going to happen in New York. It's going to happen uh, through the Bretton Woods uh, mm -hmm. process uh, and, and how uh, we address uh, what we do with those institutions in the future. And it also means addressing the impact that China has. Uh, uh, through its own uh, financing, which has in the past, and I think even I, I can say, uh, would certainly even now, has put these countries into uh, a debt trap. And we have to figure out how to help them get out of that uh, debt trap, but also how to address uh, more um, um, just reliable uh, funding and and easy to access funding. I, I think with one country I spoke to, they're like, we don't have the people to fill out all these forms <laughs> and to uh, answer all the questions that come in from the FAC. So we can't take advantage of some of this development funding because we don't have the people resources to do it. So we can help on that from that standpoint as well, you know, helping to build the capacity uh, that they have on the ground to add to that capacity by giving them uh, uh, the people resources to help them uh, access uh, this funding in a more equitable way. Absolutely, just capacity building yeah. um, can be so intently important. Well, thank you, Ambassador, for this extremely rich conversation today, and thank you for joining us. I know you have a, a very busy schedule for fitting us in. If I could ask everyone to join me in a round of applause. <laughs> thank you, Ambassador.